Great. Um, a lot of people have been asking questions about mummification and uh, what's the difference between uh, mummification and cremation and regular old burial and all that kind of stuff. And why do you do it? And what's it about? And what a waste of time and effort and energy and everything. So let me go over this again. For all the people that are new here, we put this on tape and we've talked about it the same lecture probably a good 25 times since 1975. But we'll have it on video, so if you have a question about mummification, you can review it. It's real interesting. There's been all kinds of burial rites when a person dies and stuff over the past. Throughout history, you can read about them in the history books. They buried people. Um, the Indians stick them up on these little platforms and let them dry in the sun, and they burn them and stuff like this, their bodies, and um, do different things. Let me try to compare it to several different things. Let us just say as time moves on, we discover something, the human race discovers something that's more scientific than the things in the past. Back several decades ago, there were a lot of kids catching a disease and they were getting very crippled from it and they couldn't walk and they'd be paralyzed or stuck in a wheelchair for the rest of their life and they didn't even have a name for it. And finally they came up with a name for this disease called polio, wasn't it? That was they. Yeah. Yeah. I said there was a disease called polio. And so there um, <laughs> was this guy by the name of Salk. 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 S-A-L-K. <laughs> um, went and he did a lot of research on it. And he came up with a vaccine. And they went around and inoculated everybody. And all of a sudden, the majority of the people who would have caught polio after that period of time didn't catch it anymore. And the reason, because science came to a point of knowledge where it was able to discover something that would go beyond or overcome, rise above this problem that existed. And so it was done through science. It's a very scientific thing with, um, you know, a real simple explanation. Um, back to mummification. Um, we always um, relate that to dying. Somebody dies, you mummify them. And you see all the old movies, the, the Curse of the Mummy and all these kinds of things, you know, which are really funny movies and everything. Anyway, as we look at nature, we see that everything, when it dies, it actually gives birth to something. There's all these nature movies on TV all the time that you can watch. Like when a flower dies, all the little seeds drop out of the flower onto the ground, into the dirt, and new flowers start. And so death actually is a birth. That's all it is. It's just going from one life state to another life state. That's all death really is. And because of lack of understanding, when several decades back when a child or somebody caught polio and they were crippled for the rest of their life in a wheelchair, couldn't walk or whatever, it was just devastating. It was um, unbelievable something like this could come on somebody and it was because and not understanding the science or the technology of what was taking place. And we could be very ignorant. We could look at the flower and we could say, well, oh, when the flower dies out there in the field, oh, the poor flower, everything is gone. It's gone forever and everything. Without noticing that it planted its seeds in the ground and the seeds are taking place of taking on a new birth and growing new plants and making new flowers. And it's just an, a continual cycle that takes place. Now, We've all talked about the cylinder of evolutionary absolute time. And let me get the chart out here for just a second. I'm going to walk over here and grab the chart and bring it back. And <clears throat> James will shine the camera on the cylinder of evolutionary absolute time. I'll try to make this as painless as possible. Everybody, to, to really understand this, has to get a, a good comprehension of phi, P-H-I, which is the same thing as the magic ratio, the golden mean, the additive series. That's everything that nature is designed on. We look at the sun, and we see this big yellow orange ball putting out all this energy and everything. 
and let's just say that's the life side. And what's happening on the life side is it's shining out and it's creating all this new life on the planet here at Earth that's close to it and maybe adding different forms of life and stuff in everything that it radiates out to and gives its light and energy to. On the back side of the coin of the sun is what you could call a black hole. And another universe is going out of existence into it and shining out through that sun. And so it's a creation and a destruction process going on at the same time. It's the two extremes bonded together. We see the creation from the sun side in our universe, but in our universe there's black holes that takes things out of this universe. On the other side of them is the sun shining into a new universe. And these are called eternities. And there's multiple eternities, an infinite number of eternities and universes. And so on the back side of every sun is a black hole. And on the, on the opposite side of every black hole is a sun shining into a new universe. And these are the warps between time and space from one universe to another. Anyway, if you look at it in numbers or on phi, and the formula from the previous lectures that everybody should have looked at before they look at this lecture on mummification talks about point A and point B, the distance there being the relationship as point AC is to um, AB and point CB as CB is to AC, and they all equal 1.618, which is called phi or the magic ratio. Magic ratio is um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 59, 89, 144, 233, 365, 377, on into infinity. That same thing we call this the cylinder of evolutionary absolute time. Now let's just say that we happen to be in a universe about 365 and the sun shines down on it, and evolution takes place in it. We come in there maybe as an atom, and the atom gains consciousness through experience. It becomes fulfilled with what it's doing. It flows out of being an atom and turns into a molecule. It gets larger, becomes a larger thing, incorporates itself in something larger than itself, because it allows itself to lose its consciousness of just being an atom and gains the consciousness of unity, of unity consciousness of molecules, becomes a molecule, okay? And so the molecule goes on for a while and it's all caught up in being molecule, right? I am the molecule, my molecule goes home, goes to work, goes to bed, takes care of itself, gets up, raises his kid, does all this kind of stuff. It gets full of doing that for a lot of incarnations and it flows out of, still within this same universe of molecule into um, becoming a part of a larger thing, let's just say like um, an element becomes, um, this molecule joins itself in and becomes, let's just say iron, or it becomes copper, or it becomes gold, or it becomes oxygen, or it becomes, um, now am I correct, a molecule could be, um, a mo after we go from molecule we go to element, right? No. Or have I got it backwards? There, the atoms are the elements. There's hydrogen atoms and oxygen and uh, uh, helium atoms. Okay, so I got so you're first you're the element, then you're the molecule. Okay, just backwards. Sorry. 